All right. Good evening, guys. So um, we're going to take a little break from Hebrews tonight um, with Pastor Craig not being able to be here. Uh, he asked me to fill in for him. So rather than uh, take the passage that he was already preparing for, I'm going to let him do that next week. Um, and tonight we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. So if you guys want to turn to Ephesians chapter 4, that's where we're going to be. Um, I mean, we'll be flipping back and forth to different places um, throughout the night. But um, that's our going to be our main text. And probably bit off a lot more than I probably should have, but we're going to try to get through uh, four, uh, um, Ephesians 4 verses 1 through 16. Um, so... Between all that and all the discussion I'd like to have, we might be here till 9.30, but uh, <laughs> we'll see how it works. Um, all right, so um, Ephesians chapter 4, This I would kind of uh, decided on this text before I knew what Pastor Brian was going to be speaking on yesterday. Um, for any of you who were in church yesterday morning, here at First Baptist, Pastor Ryan spoke on unity, and Ephesians chapter 4 kind of revolves around unity, so um, Lord, in His providence, worked that out for us, um, for me as well, because I kind of took some notes, and we'll be using some of those today as well to uh, just kind of go through this. So <clears throat> just uh, as you're sitting there, just continue sending prayers my way so we can do this well. Um, all right, so let's let's get started here. Ephesians chapter four, verses one through sixteen. Anybody have a strong reading voice? If you like to have a strong reading voice, you want to read that for us tonight? Sure. All right, please. Uh, one through sixteen. That's right. And remember, the microphone is up here. So if you could, make sure you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humil humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended, far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers, to equip saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitfulness schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, and we just... Uh... Lord, without your word, uh, if we don't have the word and we don't use the word in our lives, we don't study your word, we don't, we don't get into it, Lord, Lord, we would be missing, we would be missing, we would be lost, Lord. I thank you so much for, for just, the, just the hope and the faith that we find in the word you've given to us, Lord, and I pray that you just be with um, just be with us tonight as we as we get into it, Lord, and I pray that you just uh, strengthen each one of us and uh, just give us discernment as we go through this text tonight, Lord. And um, Lord, I pray that you are honored and glorified through uh, 
through what you have allowed me to prepare and, and through what you're going to do um, in our discussion and our, our teaching tonight, Lord. And thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Who is the writer of Ephesians? Who wrote this book? Paul. Very good. Very good. Craig has taught you well. <laughs> yes, Paul wrote the book of Ephesians. Um, and where did Paul write this book? If we read verse 1, you might have a good idea. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Present. Called, yes. All right. He's, he's currently, a when, in, when he's writing the book of Ephesians, he's a prisoner in Rome at this time. So, um, that's what the reference of being a prisoner for the Lord. Now, uh, he could, kind of just venturing, I don't, I don't know that I can say this dogmatically, but he could be saying being a prisoner for the Lord, just as we are a slave to Christ, and as, as believers we are, we are chained to the Lord. We cannot escape Him. Um, so he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you, you have been called. So there he uses the word you twice. Talking to, obviously he's writing this book to the people in Ephesus. But he's, is he writing this to all the people in Ephesus? Who is he writing it to? To the church, right? He's writing it to the church in Ephesus. And who is the church? Believers. The church is made up of the believers, right? So he's writing this to the believers in Ephesus. So when he says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. What is this walk he's talking about? Obviously, he's not talking about physically walking down the street. What's this walk he's talking about? Our walk with Christ. Right? The life you lead. The life you lead. Right? Right. Yeah, so he's essentially talking about our Christian life, our spiritual walk with the Lord. So he's urging them to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. What is this calling that we have been called to? Faith. Belief. Faith and belief, right? We have been called to be followers of Christ. As a follower of Christ, what does that make us? What are some other descriptive terms that that would make a follower of Christ? Other than Christian. As a follower of Christ, what, what are we to the world? Christians. Ambassadors. Ambassadors. Yes. We are ambassadors. Representatives. Ambassadors. We are called to be disciples. Right? We're called to be... Um, Disciplined in the Christian life. We are called to sanctification. It's a big word. I know you guys have heard it. What is sanctification? Becoming more Christ-like. Becoming more Christ-like. Right? I know Craig's also mentioned it many times. There's a couple different types of sanctification. We have our positional sanctification. Our positional sanctification being a one-time thing. That one-time positional sanctification is what? Justification. Justification. Salvation. All part of our salvation. Yes. So our positional sanctification, we are positionally sanctified when Christ saves us, when God calls us to him and we are saved um, through faith as a gift of God that is our positional sanctification. But the walk that he's referring to is another type of sanctification. That's going to be our progressive sanctification, right? So 
we're going to be talking a lot about that progressive sanctification uh, as we go through these 16 verses tonight. So, he says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So, verse 1, he, he says, walk in a manner worthy, and verses 2 and 3 are, he's saying, this is how you walk in a manner worthy. Right? These things that he lists there in verses 2 and 3 are gifts from the Holy Spirit. Right? These are spiritual gifts. These are fruits. Uh, sorry, I, maybe I shouldn't say they're spiritual gifts, but they, maybe they, I guess you could. Um, but we think these of, we think more of these as the fruits of the Spirit. We receive humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Uh, I'm going to have have you guys turn to a couple passages for me. If someone wants to grab Galatians 5.22, um, volunteer for that one. Sure. Rob's got that one. Colossians 3.13 and 14. If someone else grab Colossians 3.13 and 14. I'll do that. All right, Greg, thank you. All right, so as we... As we've seen in verses 2 and 3 there, um, yeah, these are, these are representative of the fruits of the Spirit. And these other two passages we're going to go to, we're going to see in a couple more lists here. So, Rob, if you want to read for us Galatians chapter 5, verses, or verse 22, please. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. All right. And if you were still looking in Ephesians 4, 2, and 3, as he was reading that, you would have seen a lot of the same characteristics. Uh, and Greg, Colossians 3, 13, and 14. Uh, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. I'm hoping you read the, yep, you read the wrong one. <laughs> no, it's okay. Colossians 3, 13 and 14. Okay, that would be why. 3, 13 and 14. My bad. I just make sure I didn't write it down wrong. <laughs> All right, redo. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Mm -hmm. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Right. Yes, so what binds everything together in perfect harmony? Putting on love, right? And bearing with one another, which was also referenced there in verse number uh, 2. Um, of Ephesians 4. So there we see that um, that is how we walk. This is how we walk in a manner worthy. If we ever have any question about how we're supposed to be living our lives, we can turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We can turn to Galatians 5.22. We can turn to Colossians 3.13 and 14. And if you follow these, that is how we walk in a manner worthy. All right? Those are the characteristics of someone who is called by Christ. Uh, also, someone can turn to Matthew 18, 15. One person grab Matthew 18, 15, and then... Okay. Yep. You got it, Shannon? Yeah. All right. Go ahead when you're ready. If your brother sins against you, 
go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. All right. All right, so as, we're, as, as he read that, that is how we bear with one another. I know I've read that before. I've read bearing with one another before. And I'm like, well, what does that really mean to, to bear with one another? Like put up with? Like is that, is that what it means to bear with one another? You just put up with the things you don't like about them? Is that how you just grin and bear it? Um, but no, Shannon, if, if you could read that again for us one more time. I'm sorry. Um, this is what it means to bear with one another as we walk in this manner worthy. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. All right. Absolutely. So we're supposed to we're supposed to walk through life with one another as we sin against each other because we are going to sin against one another, right? Who here who in here is perfect doesn't sin against their brother? Nobody. All right? We don't desire to sin against each other, but we are weak in our flesh. We struggle. We do things that we shouldn't do. We say things that we shouldn't say. We are going to sin against one another. Now, hopefully, we are putting a lot of effort and trying not to, right? We're supposed to be seeking to live our lives for the Lord um, in every aspect of our lives. But until we are glorified, until we have that final glorification, um, as long as we're here on this earth, we will continue sinning against one another. So we need to bear with one another as we do that. Um, also, I wanted to read James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Uh, in James 5, 19 and 20, James writes, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Right? This is another example of how we bear with one another. If we see someone who is a brother in Christ, if we see someone who we see every Sunday in church, or maybe we don't see them in every Sunday in church anymore, maybe we don't see them in Bible study anymore, maybe we don't have good biblical Christian conversation with them anymore, and we see them wandering, we see them fading, we see them not walking in a manner worthy, how are we supposed to re respond to that? Are we supposed to go to one-on-one -on -one and uh, point out their faults. And then I guess, according to our instructions, if he doesn't listen, to bring a couple of friends with you, two or three. And, uh, so, so what are you doing? Are you being active or passive in that? Oh, active. You're being active in that. Right? I think a lot of times we we kind of sit back and we be passive and, and we don't take the initiative to go after them. We don't take the initiative to, to see them doing something that we know, you know, that's just not right. God is calling you to, to walk in a manner worthy and you're not walking in a manner worthy. You're, you're really fading away from that. And we just sit there and we watch them walk down a path, and we know where that lead is going to lead. Yeah. Why do we do that? I think, generally speaking, a lot of times I've had this conversation with others. A, one, people don't feel comfortable approaching somebody else and talking about these topics. And then B, uh, a lot of people have the misunderstanding that they feel it's their pastor's job or their deacon's job or somebody within the quote-unquote church organization and, right. uh, that's their responsibility. Right. It's not. I mean, it is, but it's not entirely. Right. It's either we don't like conflict. It's kind of, we don't like conflict or confrontation. Judgment. Judgment. Peer, peer judgment. Peer judgment. I mean, how, how big of a deal is, is that in, in church, in society? I mean, church, I mean, for a long time, I mean, church 
especially Baptist churches, at least for me growing up, uh, Baptist uh, churches had this stigma that they were just judgmental and you could never be truthful about any sin you were going through because you would just be kind of pounded into the ground. Um, so judgment has been a very big issue in the church. Um, so that's kind of steered a lot of people in the other direction of, yeah, we're not going to be, we can't be judgmental. We don't want to come across judgmental because we're just going to push people away. But at the same time, we have to make sure that we are going to them and pointing out their faults, right? It's not a matter of <clears throat> judging them and saying you're a horrible person. It's confronting each other with our sins so that we can come to repentance, seek forgiveness, and have our relationship with the Lord being restored. Um, so a lot of it is uh, judgment, not wanting to deal with confrontation or conflict. But a lot of it, I think, is also it's someone else will do it, right? That's passive. That's passive. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, I know they're going in the wrong direction, but you know what? My pastor is seeing the same thing that I am. So if he's seeing it and I'm seeing it, he's more prepared to deal with it than I am. So I'll just let my pastor deal with it. I know I've had those thoughts before. <clears throat> is what about, that I think um, I think in general you guys we don't we don't like confrontation uh, right know, whether or not I think someone else might be better <laughs> equipped to do this than, than me uh, I think I know of a lot of people including myself that in the past you know maybe shied away from I think we tend to shy away from difficult conversations because yeah. in general, most people don't like confrontation. And so when we're going to go and have a difficult conversation with somebody, uh, we don't really generally look forward to that. And I think that that plays a role in it as well. Oh, absolutely. I know what discourages me is that idea of who am I to point out the speck in somebody else's eye? You know, I've got that log in my own. Right. Yeah, absolutely. We need to make sure that we are dealing with our own sin as well. I mean, as we've been going through, I mean, this kind of brings me back to, to what um, we've been going through in Hebrews and, and the, the Levitical priests having to deal with their own sins, make sacrifice for their own sins before they could make sacrifice for the sins of the people. We need to make sure that we are, I mean, it's not the same thing, but I think it's the same kind of idea. We have to make sure that we are dealing with our own issues or else like you said you're kind of hypocritical if you if you're looking at everybody else's issues and you're not taking care of your own um, so there is there is truth to that but we also have to make sure that we are caring for one another by speaking to each other and, and pointing out where we where we are not walking in that that worthy manner um, Yes. But wouldn't it be like what Brian was saying yesterday was you don't do it in front of everybody, though? Correct. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. We, we do want to be very cautious and careful as to how, how, we, how we approach those situations. We don't want to humiliate somebody by any means. Um, we want to do it in a way that is loving. We want to do it in a way that we are caring for that person. Uh, we do need to make sure that we are... Um, sharing with them what we are seeing and, and the concern that we have for them. But again, yes, we do need to make sure that we are caring for that person by doing it in a way that is, um, as, as we read in Matthew 18, go to that person one-on-one, -on -one, right? And if you need to, bring someone else along. But it's, so it's not a public humiliation by any means. Uh, we are caring for that person by going to them on a personal level. <clears throat> and again, we are bearing with one another in love. As we go back to, to verse 2 there in, in Ephesians 4, we're bearing with one another in love, right? We don't go out and point out each other's faults just to say, you broke a rule, now you have to sit in the corner. 
No, no, we go after them so that we can so that we can help them to grow and to bring them back into um, into communion with and the fellowship of believers, so we can bring them back and restore the relationship with the Lord. <clears throat> All right. Whew. Almost half an hour gone, and we're only through three of the 16 verses I wanted to do. So here we go. Uh, we, any other thoughts on that before we keep going? No? Nope. All right. All right, so verse 4, there is one body and one spirit. I'll stop right there for a minute. There is one body. What's, what are we talking about here? I mean, body I think Christ, the, body, the body of Christ. There is one body, meaning there is one church, right? There is one universal church, the entire body of those who God has called to himself. Um, we are united as that one body. So there is one body and one spirit. If you are saved, if you have that salvation, have the faith in Jesus Christ, we all have that one spirit residing in us. We have that Holy Spirit of God that has come and has dwelt in us. That is that uniting spirit. So just as you were called to the one hope, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, so that's referring to, you were called to that one hope. That one hope is your salvation in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Continuing in verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's only one, right? Again, if we are saved, if God has called us, we are his children we have that Holy Spirit. We are one together. Um, when we are all one, we are. We have that unity within each other, um, amongst each other. We have that likeness um, together as one body. <clears throat> and uh, verse 6 continues, says, One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all, and in all. How many gods are there? How many big G gods are there? There is one. It doesn't matter what the world tells us, there is one God and Father of all. He is over all and through all and in all. What is that referring to? Over all, through all, and in all. His omnipresence, right? Yep, yeah, he is in all, and through all, over all. What is him being over all? One, one main word I'm looking for, but there's a lot of me could probably shout out. Sovereign. Sovereign. He inhabits his creation. Mm -hmm. Yes, he does. It's, God is sovereign in everything. He is sovereign over everything. He is sovereign over our salvation. He is sovereign over the creation of the world. He is sovereign over every aspect of this, of this life. Now, and he is our father. Just think about that for a minute. The God who is, who created this earth. I mean, I know I've had these thoughts before. I'm sure you have as well, but the God who created this earth, who formed each and every one of us, so many different ways that we can look at the universe and just see the see, just be in awe of of God and who He is. And yet He is our Father. Is and we are Is He everybody's father? Well, He is our Father. No, He is not everybody's father. Correct. Thank you, Rob. He is not everybody's father. Right? He is only the, the father to those who he has adopted as his sons and daughters. Those who he has called to himself. But for those of you who have been adopted as a son or a daughter, he is our father. And we are united as brothers and sisters in that way. 
All right. So when it says Father of all, you think as the Creator, you don't think that that makes Him Father even of those who have not been obedient to His call? No, He... He wouldn't be father of those who are not his. Right? Well, I don't know. It says father of right. all. Right. And so it, it makes you wonder if he, he... It's his creation. That, you know, he's God the Father. So just because a person doesn't recognize him as his father, that the, just because you don't agreed to recognize your father, let's say your earthly father, that doesn't change the fact that he's your father. Okay. I see what you're saying. Craig, you have any words of wisdom on that? <laughs> I don't know how wise they are, but um, I tend to say I think there's some medium ground here uh, on the I tend to certainly... Um, I think that you know the first thing Matt articulated is is correct to say, uh, you know that God is the Father of all those that He has chosen to call His children. Uh, I also recognize what Rob said to be that you know in the sense of God the Father being the Creator of all things, uh, you know, think of it as Jesus, right? Jesus is Lord of all. Uh, he's Lord not because you you know you make Him Lord of your heart or something. He's Lord because God made Him. He is Lord over all creation, over everything. And one day, every tongue will confess that he is that, right? To the glory of God the Father. So I understand, I think, in the context of what of what uh, Rob's saying. So in that in that sense, I would say that you're both, you know, having having biblical and accurate thoughts. I would say in the context of, of these verses we're going through, um, you know, that I tend to just lean towards he's the father of all, you know, of all believers, of children, because... Uh, you can look at the so when I go through Ephesians four, look at look at verses four to to where are you at six. Yep. And he, I've got circled the, I have the word one circled in my Bible. He goes, uh, one two three four five six seven. So in the two verses there, you've got the word one seven times, mm -hmm. and all referring to God, right, and the Spirit and His salvation. And, and Paul is making a point here to point that out, that just as God, the triune God and salvation and all that God is doing through the Godhead is one, that we are called to be one like that. And as, as Matt moves forward, that's going to be the, the transition and what we're seeing Paul is pointing out, that the unity that God has in the Godhead is the unity that God wants us to have in the church. And I think of John 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer, where he prays, uh, on behalf of the disciples and, you know, I believe all disciples, all Christ followers, he says, you know, uh, God, you know, give them unity and, and let them be one as you and I are one. And so um, that's a long answer. I'll stop now. But I think the, the oneness it just focuses in as Paul is going to focus in on the, on the oneness and the unity of God and then pointing to the oneness and unity we're supposed to have. And so, you know, I would say the Father in that context is speaking of, yes, God, the Father, Creator, but He is Father of all of us who He's yeah. calling to be united. Thank you, Craig. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, let's continue to verse 7. All right, so verses 1 through 6. Um Paul is really focusing, as even as Craig was just saying, he's very, he's really focusing on um, the unity that we have, uh, the oneness. Um, but verse seven starts with the word "but." So, to me, that means okay, something's changing. Okay, he's saying "but." So verse seven says, "But grace was given to each one of us." according to the measure of Christ's gift. All right, so in verses 1 through 6, essentially, Paul is saying we are all the same. We all, re all of us who are 
sons and daughters of God, we are all the same. We are all united in that one salvation. So we are in that way. We are all the same. But in verse 7, he says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. What does that mean? Any thoughts before I share mine? No, that's fine. You might have them, you just don't want to share them. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. We do not all receive the same gifts. We do not all receive the same amount of grace in our lives. Now, this isn't, I'm not referring to uh, the grace that was shown to us in our salvation, okay? I'm referring to other grace, and, and we'll get into that as well. Um, now, verses 8 through 9, uh, 8 through 10, I'm going to read through them. I have some notes on them, but this could get really deep, and uh, so I'm going to cover it real quick. Um, so therefore, it says, when he ascended, so he being Christ, he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. This actually comes from Psalms. It's a foreshadowing of Christ ascending um, and giving his gifts to men when he, when he does. In verse 9, saying, in saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? So, this is speaking to the deity of Christ, right? So, he initially descended. Um, actually doing some reading on that. Some, some people think that that, uh, some theologians, some scholars think that that descending um, could be either referring to either his descending from heaven, which um, would again be speaking to his deity. Um, some others think that it, it could be referring to his descending into the earth in his death and then his, um, his resurrection, or could be, re could be referring to both in that case. Um, I, I'm not uh, dogmatic on, on that, um, but the fact that he did descend, uh, both of them really would be referring to his deity, um, descending from heaven, and then ascending back to heaven. <clears throat> so, um, that's really something that we could spend a lot of time on um, if we wanted to, but it's not totally critical. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's even all that critical to, to the point that Paul is trying to make here. I think uh, the point that he's, he's intending to make through this is just speaking to the deity of Christ and that he ascended, and when he did, he gave gifts to men. Um, <clears throat> so as we continue, verse, uh, I'll just read, uh, continue from verse 10. He, being Christ, who descended, is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. So, we'll continue now to verse 11. And this is where I think he's talking about the different measures of Christ's gift, uh, the different measures of grace that are given. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers in order to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Are those all the same thing? Do they all do the same thing? No. No, they don't. If they all did the same thing, then there wouldn't be a reason to list five different, five different things there. Um... The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, these are all differing or varying types of gifts that were given um, from Christ to, <clears throat> to his people. Uh, and it, when you look at those, those roles that he gave to, to uh, his disciples, some of those roles that he gives to men currently, um, those are roles of, of leadership. Right, so when you when you think of the people in those roles, they are leading. So these are leadership type roles. <clears throat> is everyone created to be 
an apostle or a prophet? Is everyone created to be an evangelist, a shepherd, a teacher? And again, we're referring specifically to the roles within the church as he's speaking to the church. No, there are many who, who are not equipped in that way. That they, they have not received that measure of grace. Right, so this this different differing measures of grace that um, we're referring to, different measure of Christ's gift that Paul is referring to here is just showing that we each have different abilities and gifts that God has given to us to use. Right. I mean, if you just look at look at the men within this church, look at the men within this group. All right, look at uh, some of the men who are joining us here on on Zoom. <clears throat> we are all different people, right? God has gifted us all in different ways. If he made us all teachers, then who would be there to teach, right? If we were all given the gift of shepherding, then who are we going to shepherd? So, <clears throat> I, think, I think it helps us to understand that, you know, if we don't have a certain gift that doesn't... If, we shouldn't strive for something that God just hasn't gifted us with. Now, granted, we should always be striving to improve in our lives, improve in our weaknesses, but it's okay if God hasn't gifted you with the ability to teach. I know, personally for myself growing up, I grew up in the church, I grew up in youth group, and I thought that the men who I saw as the most spiritual men in my life were the pastor or the youth leader, the people who were up front teaching. So my thought was, well, I know the Lord wants me to really grow in my, in my walk with him. He really wants me to, to be spiritual. That means I need to be a teacher too. Now, I don't know that the Lord has gifted me in that way. Maybe he has. Um, certainly never... It was always a struggle for me, thinking that I had to be that guy up front. This is not a comfortable place for me <laughs> when I'm speaking. When I'm singing, that's different. The Lord has gifted me in that way. Um, but not, not this. Um, maybe the Lord is, is using this as an opportunity to help me develop that gift. Uh, I don't know. But it doesn't mean that the things that we are weak in, that we... We have to always be striving to be something that we're not. We don't need to strive for the gifts that God hasn't given to us. Um, now, that really wasn't part of my notes. That's just kind of, hopefully, I got something out of that. Hopefully, you did as well. The Lord worked through me as, as I was going through that. Um, so, I think, there. I think if I may, Matt, I yep. think you said well, uh, and I think you give a good point, a good example to say, the, the, the difference that, you know, we all are members and body parts of the body. Yep. And so your, to your point to add, you know, Paul's imagery and analogy, you know, we can't all be the foot, you know, the body won't function well as just one big foot. Right. Uh, so, you know, your, your point is certainly valid and that he does gift different gifts, but also different measures of faith. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and to different people, and everyone's measure of faith is different. Everyone's measurement of understanding the scriptures is different. As he would gift, you know, those who call, are called to be uh, shepherds slash teachers, you know, he would gift them probably with the, the ability to understand better than than others. And so, right. again, it's got and it says he's doing it for his glory. It's for his purpose as he sees fit. And I think if you uh, if we can go back look at look at chapter three of Ephesians, just flip back one one page maybe in your Bible, look at verse two. Uh, ch chapter three, verse two, Paul says, um, I'll just start here again because in, in the first verse of chapter three you have the prisoner again that you talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, for the reason I call a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, listen to this. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, which is exactly what now he's expounding on in, in the text that you're leading us through. And then look down at verse 8. He says, to me, though I am the very least of the saints, this grace was given 
to preach the, to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So we see Paul showing himself as an example to say, this stewardship of God, he's given me that by his grace and both those things, that it's God's grace who gave me this giftedness because he called me to be this part of the body. And so, you know, now that you're saying what you're saying about yourself and others, you know, he's expounding on that here to say we're all called by God's grace in different ways. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And that's, that's awesome. So yeah. I, I think that was a good awesome. summary of what I was trying to say. So. <laughs> Well, that's what I'm saying. You sparked mine. I'm saying to you oh, okay. that was applicable and great to hear it as, a, as an example, you know, as, as you gave that. Yeah. Uh, to say, yep, that's exactly what Paul's talking about. Great. Thank you very much. Um, all right. So as we continue to verse 12, uh, verse 12, well, let's, let's go from verse 11 into 12. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. He gave those men the gifts that he gave them for what purpose? Right, for sharing the gospel, for equipping the saints for the ministry. Right? So again, we have those men who are in those positions... What, uh, whatever position they, they might be in, to equip the saints. Who are the saints? Those who are saved, those who are chosen, those who are set apart, those who are sanctified. Um, so the intention, the reason that we have that he gave those gifts was to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And it continues, uh, Paul continues, for the building up of the body of Christ. For building up the believers, for for building up the church, right? For the work of the ministry, for the building up of the church. The purpose that he gives the gifts to men is not so those men can go out and be proud and arrogant and say, yeah, I'm this great preacher, I'm this great apostle, look at me, follow after me because I have this great gift that the Lord has given to me. No, the reason he gave those gifts is for the building up of the church, for the building up of the body of Christ. <clears throat> All right, so um, continuing into verse 13. We might, we might get through it all. Continuing into verse 13. So building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Until we all, again, who is the we all? Until we, the believers, the church. Just some of the believers? Nope. All. All of the believers, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Would you? Till we all attain to the unity of the faith. So, we are, we're, we're here. We're being trained by these these uh, shepherds, these teachers, these pastors. <clears throat> For the building up of the body of Christ. Until when? Until we all attain to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God. To mature manhood. How do we get to mature manhood? How do we grow? So we'll, just, we'll just speak physically for right now. How do we grow physically? Through nourishing our bodies, right? How do bodybuilders grow? Exercise, Exercise working, working out, training. We were just talking about we were talking about the Olympics earlier, right? How do you how do you get to Olymp to the Olympics? Train hard. 
Train hard once a week? Every day. Train hard every day. Dedication. Right? If we want to achieve mature manhood, if we want to achieve... And continuing our progressive sanctification, we have to be dedicated to the Word of God. We have to be dedicated to walking in a manner worthy of the calling, right? We should be constantly desiring to be growing, to striving for the mature manhood. And we can only do that by being in the Word, We can only do that by being in fellowship. We can only do that by being under sound teaching and preaching. We can only do that by relying on God and being dedicated to Him with our lives. So, from what I'm seeing in Ephesians chapter 4, so far is he's, he's speaking so much about, yes, we are united in our salvation. But beyond our salvation, how else are we going to be united? We're going to be united with one another as we grow spiritually together, as we grow in the Word of God together. All right? Are you... If someone has been dedicated to studying the Word of God in their life and they've been been living for the Lord, for 40 years, and each and every day they're in the Word, they're praying, they are, they are in church, they're in Bible study. And then you, you put them next to someone who has been just a Sunday Christian for 40 years. They go to church on Sundays, the rest of the week they, they just live their life however they see fit. Um, we'll, we'll even say that they, that they are truly, genuinely saved. They've just never put any effort into their own, their sanctification. Outside of their salvation, how much unity do those two men really have? I would, I would, I would beg to say there's not a whole lot of unity there outside of the fact that they are both saved. They both have the same faith in Christ. So when it says that this is going to these teachers and pastors are going to build God's people for works of service so they can get built up until we all reach unity. Is that, do we all reach unity this side or that side? Uh, I would say it's it's not until it's not until we are glorified. We don't ever achieve our total unity because again, as long as we're here on this earth, we are constantly going to be in we are going to be in sin. Uh, not slaves to sin any longer, but um, there will be things that are not allowing us to be totally unified. Right? But just like anything else, just because we will never achieve that perfect that perfect place this side of heaven, we should always be striving for it. All right. Um so yeah, as far as, and how do we strive for unity with one another? Again, we can go back to bearing with one another in love, right? We bear with one another. Sorry, I keep asking a question that I keep answering it before I give you guys a chance. So much for my desire for discussion. I do desire, I'm just not giving you the chance for it. Um, so thanks, thanks for that, Shannon. Yeah, it's, it's, it started clicking, you know, like, okay, well, you know, how are we all... You know, we're all supposed to to be unified. Well, we're unified if we call each other out, just like the, the guy that's been you know, in church studying hard for 40 years and the other guy that just shows up to church, you know, once a week. You know, the the guy that, that studies hard and he's in the Word, he should go to the other guy and say, well, you know... This is this is what helps me. This is what I do, you know, and, and try to try to unify with him, you know, to, to build up the to build up the church. Right. So. Absolutely. Ding ding ding. Ding ding ding. I like the light bulbs. Yeah. Praise the Lord.
Oh, man. All right. Uh, any other thoughts on that before I try to finish out? We've got a couple more minutes just to just to kind of close it all up. All right. Um, so 14 uh, to the end. So that we may no longer be children, right? So we just got, we just came through um, coming to until attaining to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children, right? We talked about this as we've gone through Hebrews um, and as we've gone through, uh, through other studies together. So that we may no longer be children, referring to spiritual immaturity, a total lack of any depth in our spiritual life and, and relationship with the Lord. We should not be content with living on milk. We should not be content with not having solid food. We should be yearning for that. We should be, uh, we should be living on the solid food because um, that's the only way we're going to continue to grow. Um, if we're content with being children, unfortunately, there's too many people content with being children, which I think is a lot of the reason why there is so much disunity within, within the church today. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with um, just some churches maybe being wayward, um, but I think even, even in solid biblical churches, there are too many people who are just content with milk, just content with getting by. I'm surviving on milk, so that's good enough for me. We should not be content with just being children. A lot of the churches are just milk dispensaries. Right. Mm -hmm. For sure. Formula mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it, it really is sad. It truly is very sad. Um, and we wonder why the, the church is in such the condition that it's in today. Anyway, uh, we'll keep going. <clears throat> As children, you'd be tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. All right? If we're just on milk, then we don't know how to, we're not strong enough to deal with anything. All right? We're not, we don't, if you're just children, I mean, how many children know how to, how to deal with adult issues, how to deal with adult problems? Most of them they would, have, would be lost. They would be totally lost. I think of, I think of my four-year-old and my seven-year-old, give them an adult problem, and they'd be in a corner crying. Right? Or they would be, they'd be carried away by someone coming along and telling them this is the right way to do it. They don't know any better. If we remain children, we, we, we remain comfortable and content with being children and not knowing any better, then it's no wonder we're going to get carried away by things that aren't biblical. It's no wonder we're going to get drawn away by things that, you know, it's just not right. That's not what the Bible says. But yet we see so many Christians out there who are not walking in a manner worthy. They're wayward. They're going in the wrong direction. Why is that? A lot of times it's because they're just little children. They don't know any better. But whose fault is that? It's their own fault because they haven't been in the Word. They haven't dedicated themselves to the Word of God. They haven't dedicated themselves to the body, to the unity of the body. Now, again, as Craig had referenced uh, earlier and as, and as we read earlier, um, we are all given different levels of faith. We are all given different levels of grace. But we are all, as sons and daughters of God, we are all called to sanctification. We are all called to growing in our relationship with the Lord. We have no excuse. Not one believer has an ex any excuse for walking away, for being wayward, for being drawn away by, by poor doctrine. We are called to be in the Word and to grow in the Word. All right, so continuing this up, rather, speaking the truth in love. And again, it comes back to speaking the truth in love, 
bearing with one another, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head. Who is the head of the body? Jesus Christ. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head. Into Christ. Yeah, we should have just finished the verse and I answered that question. Um, I think of um, a little diagram that, that I was taught in marriage counseling. You have God who is up here on top of the triangle and then husband and wife down here. I think the same thing applies to the church. Christ is the head. As each and every one of us down here are moving towards Christ. As each and every one of us are growing towards Christ, growing to be more like Christ. What does that do to this guy over here and this guy over here? Right? If we're both coming this way towards Christ, what does that do to them? Brings them closer together. Brings them closer together right? They might, they might hardly ever talk to each other. They might not even know each other. But as they come closer and closer to Christ, and then they finally meet one day, they're like brothers. They've never met before, but first conversation, they feel like they're, they've been best friends. Why is that? The unity they have in Christ and the strength that they have and the unity they have because of their closeness to Christ bringing them closer together as one. Right? Right. Right. Good. Okay. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, so let's finish this out. So we are um, grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined together and held together by every joint with which, is, with, with which it is equipped. Christ holds it all together. Right? If we try adding anything if we try relying on anything other than God, other than Christ, if we try relying on any of that to hold it together, it's going to fall apart because Christ is what holds it all together. Held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So as we work together, as we, as we work individually on our own sanctification, on our own growth and development, our own becoming more Christ-like, we are going to come closer together and be more united as a church, as a body of believers. There are many ways to do that as far as uh, trying to unite with one another. One of the things, and I, and I close with this, uh, one of the things that... that struggled with over my life in speaking the truth in love. Um, I've understood for a long time that we need to make sure we are speaking the truth to one another. We need to tell each other when we're wrong. We need to tell each other uh, what the Bible says about this situation or that situation. But as Paul repeated over and over again here, and as, uh, as Shannon referred to a little bit earlier, we again need to bear with one another in love, right? So as we speak the truth to one another, as we come alongside one another, trying to draw our brother back from the wayward path that they're taking, again, the main motivation behind that is love for that brother. We desire for them to be in unity and be in fellowship. We desire for our relationship to be restored with them. But most of all, we desire for that relationship with the Lord to be restored in them. And then as we build each other up in love, we will grow closer together as brothers. We will grow closer together as a body. And we will be able to use each of our gifts, however different they might be, they are all a part of the body. As Craig referred to earlier, we are all different parts of the body. You might be a toe, you might be an eye, you might be a foot, you might be a hand. Um, but take this pen. You might, you might think, well, I'm just a finger. How important is a finger? Fingers aren't that important, are they? How am I going to pick up that pen without, without my fingers? Right? 
The hand is really important. We use our hands all the time, every day. Hands are extremely important. Right? People survive without them, but it makes their lives very difficult, much more difficult than when you have working hands. But what good is a hand without fingers? Right? The finger is a small little thing, right? And even the, the little toe, a little pinky toe. What kind, of good, what kind of balance do you have without your pinky toe? Well, until it's missing, you don't really understand how important that toe is. Um, so anyway, just one, that was just one last illustration that I had about the body. Um, it's important. It doesn't matter how the Lord has gifted you. Your gifts are important to the body of Christ. And we need to make sure that we are dedicated and devoted to the Lord so that we can build ourselves up and make sure that we are prepared and equipped to be able to be used in the body. Um, so I think that's all I've got for you guys tonight. Any, you guys have any thoughts on anything that we talked about? I know we've already kind of gone over by eight minutes, but uh, definitely want to hear some more from you guys. I didn't allow for as much discussion as I wanted to. So any, any of you Zoomers have anything to add or... I like the illustration you used as far as God being the top and then us as a church being, you know, spread out down below. And then, you know, as you get closer to Christ, you, you both, you know, as a church get closer. I just thought that was an interesting illustration that makes a whole lot of sense when you really think about it in that situation. Yeah. So, kudos. Good job. Thanks. Yeah, that's glory to the Lord because, I mean, I'd never thought about it until... I was preparing for this, and it's kind of one of those things that he gave me. So just thank him. Glad it was able to uh, have an impact. So, all right. Nothing from Zoom. All right. I've hogged up airspace, Tom Dean. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I thank you guys so much. Um, I hope you got something out of it um, that you can take. And I just pray that you just, uh, we just, I mean, I, I love being here Monday nights. And I think, I mean, I, mean, I think this and just uh, just growing in, in our knowledge of the word, knowledge of, of the Lord together. I think that in itself brings unity. I think that's what I think brings a lot of us coming back is just the unity that we have in that and each of us growing in that way. So uh, thank you guys for being here and uh, hope to see you next week. Hope to see uh, you guys that are able to be uh, be back from Zoom and back here with us next week. Um, and um, hopefully we pack this place out next Monday. Amen. All right. Well, well, thank you very much, Matt. Yeah, you did thank you guys. Thanks, Matt. Thank you for all that. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, Let's see. I'll, I'll close it out. I'll, I'll, yeah, sorry, Don. Did you have something? I saw a hand. Did you have something? No. Oh, okay. All right, let's pray. That's a close, guys. Lord, we just thank you so much for tonight. Um, Lord, I thank you for, for just the opportunity to just share your word with uh, these men. And uh, Lord, I pray that in my stumbling and um, that uh, these guys were able to to just hear your word through me, Lord. And I just, um, again, just thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be an instrument for you. And I just thank you for each of these guys and just the unity we have in, in your son, Jesus Christ, and even more, the, the unity we will have in the body as we, as we continue to grow and be developed for you and we continue to uh, strive to, to serve you and, and whatever, whatever gifts you've given to each one of us, Lord. So, Lord, um, just strengthen us as we leave here tonight, and I just pray that you just allow us to uh, to just live our lives for you as we go throughout the rest of the week uh, in all that we do in every aspect, and uh, give us strength to to uh, just share the gospel with someone who needs to hear it. Yeah. Give us the strength to to come alongside a brother who um, who just needs some someone to show love to them and and point out something that that uh, they need to have addressed in their life, Lord. Help us to come alongside one another in, in our lives in, in every aspect and just strengthen one another as we, as we strive to just navigate through this, uh, this difficult world that we're in, Lord. 
and just deal with the sin that that we that we struggle with in our in ourselves <laughs> and the sin that we struggle with in the world around us. So, um, Lord, again, just strengthen us as we leave here and pray that you are honored and glorified with our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. All right, thanks a lot, guys.